So today we have uh, second uh, lecture. So our distinguished professor, distinguished visiting professor of Nazarbayev University, uh, Professor J George Smoot, is working with us around four five years. We are working and developing international cosmic laboratory in Nazarbayev University. So there are good collaboration between the Kazakhstan and the international community who are doing research in cosmology. So uh, Professor Smoot, please welcome. The floor is yours. I'm happy to see you here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kana, and, and all the other people. And, uh, you know, uh, so originally we planned the public talk and then I thought a talk specific for physics and astronomy students, but I got told it was promoted to a higher level. That probably makes it about the right level for physics and astronomy students because there hasn't been very much time. So let me try and get here to where I'm sharing my screen. and start the talk. So the title that I gave originally for the talk is Interpreting the LIGO Virgo Gravitational Wave Events in Light of the Increased Statistics. And I modified that to what's the future because I am uh, uh, attempting to make it more accessible to more students and I will spend less time than I planned on originally of explaining how you do science. Although if I get a good chance sort of later in the talk, I'll explain why LIGO has done so many amazing things in the past, why it's got complicated in the future, and in fact, how classic uh, behaviors and how you, how you do science lead to both the great step forward, but also some side issues. So. Hopefully that will come through. And here is the, one of the problems that comes up. From, I don't know, do, do you see it? I see it, okay. All right, so now if I can get this back. Okay, so here's the relevant thing. On the uh, left-hand side is a plot of time and days of the operation of the LIGO-Virgo uh, consortium uh, detectors. And for the early part of it, for observing run one, it was only LIGO, the two LIGO detectors. And for most of observing run two, it was mostly just the two LIGO detectors. And Virgo joined in towards the end of observing run. And during the observing run three, all three detectors were running most of the time. And you'll two, see two things. You'll see that the number of events as a function of time over here on the right hand side, there's a step up for each event, right? And you can see, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. And by the end of observing run two, when sensitivity had improved, they were up to uh, a total of 11 events. With the new observing run in, because of improvement sensitivity, with the improvement sensitivity in observing run three, you can see the events come in at a much faster rate. That's because the sensitivity was greater. Therefore, the volume over which they were searching for gravity wave events was much bigger. And that continued into observing run three. What was made available two and a half weeks ago were the data from observing run three, which adds another 33 events. And so far in observing run 3b, there are 18 uh, what they call alerts. They presume will turn into real, uh, real events for a total of about 62. So we've gone from 11 to 62, although at this time we've gone from 11 to 50. So that's a big change. Now the other thing that uh, is going on is that CAGRA, which is the, I'll tell you about later, is getting ready to come online and that will be available in Observatory 1.4. It was supposed to be here at the end of three, but they had problems including flooding of the tunnels and so forth. And in the more distant future, LIGO and the O will come online. Okay, so here's the, the more detail about the revise. And what I showed you before was what it was until very recently. And now you can see CAGRA 
is coming from observing on four, and it will have not so great sensitivity, but be upgraded by the end until it has similar sensitivity almost to Virgo, but not as much as the advanced LIGO. And then LIGO India will probably show up in late 2025. And you see in the middle a map of the Northern Hemisphere, and you can see the two the star detectors right, with LIGO in Hanford, Washington, and then Livingston, Louisiana, and Virgo in Pisa, and Kagra in Kam uh, Kamioka in Japan, and the proposed LIGO India here. So the Northern Hemisphere is going to be well represented. There were people who wanted to do stuff in the Southern Hemisphere. The Australian government has not stepped up yet, so there's some things going on. So the second generation network, the first generation was LIGO, and then advanced LIGO was the second generation. The second generation network is Virgo, LIGO, and CAGRA. Although CAGRA has some of the features that you might think about having in a 3D detector already, or some of the things that might be in a more advanced version. So the three observing runs are basically done. On the right-hand side, you see sort of artist's cutaway of the mountainous region near uh, Kamioka, uh, where the Kamioka the neutrino detector is, but where there are underground three kilometer arms. And one of the, wait, being underground is one of the advances. And having the mirrors be cryogenic is another one of the major advances that, that Kagra has. They've been running slowly, but they've been making steady progress. And so that's something to look forward to in the, in the, very, in the relatively near future. Okay, so what have they got so far? Well, besides showing that there are gravity waves and therefore General Tavis' last big prediction was done and finding binary black holes and then the neutron star black hole of um, the neutron star, neutron star merger, uh, there have been good tests of general relativity, particularly tests in the strong gravitational field regime, and the properties are in agreement with general relativity. In terms of astrophysics and cosmology, there have been reasonable estimates of compact binary parameters, the mass, the spin, the rate, and the populations. We now know that there's roughly 20 merging binary black holes or compact objects per gigacubic parsec per year. Right? And uh, so now you have to figure out a gigaparsec is 3 billion light years. So 27. Uh, cubic billion billion light years. Uh, so quite a large section, a significant fraction of the universe, but not the whole universe. It's quite a lot. And there is what is claimed to be the first observation of a immediate, intermediate vast black hole. We'll talk about that in some detail and uh, look at that event very carefully because it has a lot of things to say because it also violates one of the two areas that we thought had mass gaps in terms of relic remnants. And, and, uh, but that and, that and the fact that there's an immediate back hole, those are major things going uh, forward. There's speculated that there are intermediate mass black holes. And there have been some candidates and so forth, but there's been no definite one. And there's been detection of the EM counterpart um, due to the fact that they had three detectors and had four detectors will help on that. And that was the neutron neutron star. And perhaps it was in one other uh, event that, that hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about. And that neutron star mergers are the origin of the short gamma ray burst and the heavy elements. And there's a kind of independent measure of the Hubble expansion rate, although it falls in between the, the two camps that are now uh, vying and, and on trying to understand exactly what the expansion rate of the universe is. And there's even constraints on the neutron star's equation of state. That is, the nuclear material, uh, you know, the, the, is there's an extra force that's keeping the neutrons apart or attracting to each other, you know, how, how springy or is neutron star matter. Okay, so all of those things are interesting. All of those things are being developed. Okay, so the near-term upgrades that are coming, uh, and I'll talk about advanced Virgo because I have a nice picture of it 
advanced Virgo, which is plan phase one, which is plan for the observing run four, is making an effort to introduce uh, the quantum uh, noise reduction. There's two things that you do there. One is you put filters in the laser, uh, the, the input laser light is in a recycled thing and it's filtered. And the exit <coughs> from the interrometer is, is filtered. And that's a way you clean up some of the quantum noise. But the other quantum noise is to make it a squeezed quantum state so that you can flatten out the region where the noise is minimum. And so you see in black and the curve on there as a function of frequency, the noise signal level from for the advanced LIGO and their goal to go down in the first level, first phase down to the purple level, which should give out to a distance of 100 megaparsecs. And then in, in the sort of pink or reddish color for phase two, reducing the thermal noise. That's a sort of you do a number of things, one of which is cooling the mirrors. And that should allow you to get out another factor of two in distance, which should give you another factor of eight in events, uh, assuming we understand what's going on. LIGO, uh, the advanced LIGO is going to be advanced plus LIGO, A plus LIGO. And it's on the same schedule. They're all designed. Everybody's down. Everybody's making improvements. And everybody is trying to get it ready to have the observing room at the same time because you do so much better with all the detectors on. And Kagra will, will be online with a better sensitivity. And LIGO India is scheduled for 2025. By the time they get to observing run, <coughs> five, if everything is working well, they should be able to get to a thousand detections per year or three detections a day. That is, so that's, that's quite ambitious. We'll see what it is, but I, I wouldn't be surprised for them to get up to, to within a factor of three of that. But that, and that still gives you very high rates. That gives you a lot of statistics for what, what you're going to look at. Okay. <coughs> and you can think about what's the overall future if it's somehow by 2026 you're getting up to the three events per day, what happens between 2026 and roughly 2034 or 35 when the next um, possible detector is on? There's one detector that's, a, that's approved. That's LISA, the laser interferometer in space. Right now its launch is scheduled for 2034. The people who are working on it were really disappointed. However, that is so far away. However, it's, there are some technical problems to still overcome, but mostly it's a, it's a budget and management scheduling to be able to get everything ready for that time. It's a very complex mission. There are also proposals in, in Europe for what's called the Einstein Telescope and in the United States for what's called the Cosmic Explorer. So let me mention those uh, eventually. And that means in the region from 2026 up to 2034 there's a 10-year gap in which you have to think, can you upgrade, you know, is it worth still running? Can you upgrade these detectors to get more out of it? Or are you just going to be collecting data for 10 years? And that's, that's going to be coming up on people's plates fairly soon. Okay, so let me talk about the third generation detectors and you'll see. So the Einstein telescope and the Cosmic Explorer. On the target there is to have a tenfold improvement in the subsidy with respect to the second generation. And there are two proposals, the Einstein telescope, which is 10 kilometers. It's got a xylophone configuration that is a triangle. And uh, it's cryogenic and it's underground. That's what is proposed. And the Cosmic Explorer is proposed to scale LIGO to 40 kilometers. And that's the picture on the upper right. And uh, it's uh, the question is whether it'll be underground or whatever it is. So it's drawn kind of maybe you know, whatever the kind. So if you look down in the lower left and the lower right, you will see what the goal is. Right now, the telescopes don't see out very far. The distance I can see isn't so great. Um, and the one event that we'll spend some time talking about is taken to be at a redshift of 0.82, right? With the new generation, they want to be able to redshift of two. With the nine times the telescope, want to be able to get out to a redshift of 100. We, don't, we believe the first generation of stars is really happening at redshift of one and below. And uh, 
a tenon blob, sorry. Now on this chart on the, on the left, it's showing that they're, that they're starting at a redshift of 20, but we'll see. And so you see the red and the pink curve, which are ideas about how far these detectors could see, right? And what sort of, of uh, mass, and given the source frames mass, the local mass that they will be able to detect. And uh, so it's, uh, you know, the, they, they have a slightly different response, but in principle, you can see out to where any, any ones you're seeing out past the redshift of 20 are probably primordial black holes coming together. Some of us don't think they're primordial black holes of, this, of the right scale uh, and they have the 30 to 50 solar mass, but that's something you would test and see. There are other ways to test for that. So the goal is that you're looking, you know, out 50 years from now, you're beginning to look over a big fraction of the universe and being able to detect things. And you're going to be able to do that. This is not showing here. You're going to be able to do that with LISA, but you also would like something like the Einstein telescope so you can do it uh, with, the, you know, the higher frequency uh, interferometers. Okay, so here's the idea of LISA, which just stands for Laser Interferometer in Space. It's, uh, it's made, again, in that configuration of three. There's a reason you want three and rather than the, and, and make it a closed loop rather than just the L shape by sending the laser all the way around, the laser signal around a complete triangle, you get the closed phases and a bunch of other things. So in this picture is this beautiful black hole with a jet uh, that sending gravity waves out and the LISA interferometer is going to pick them up. You see the sun, you see the earth and the moon, and you see the scale that these, this interferometer is on. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you the complex dynamics. So that triangle is the equilateral triangle, are the three satellites that are taking the test masses that have to go flying drag free. And the blue circle is the earth and the yellow thing in the center is the sun. And of course they're all going around the very center, but it's inside the sun, so it's, it's fine. So it is complicated. There were, were when it was proposed, a number of technical issues. There were three really major technical issues. One is, can you make a drag, a, a split in satellite up in space that's low enough noise and drag free on the test mass and still sense the test mass and, the, and do it? And in 2015, European Space Agency launched the Pathfinder and they achieved with that Pathfinder, even though it wasn't supposed to be quite that good, sufficient to do LISA. So one of the three major new technologies, you have to be able to fly constellations of spacecraft and fly them in such a way that you're, they're, they're in free fall, but that you can track and estimate the distance between them so you can take out the inevitable drifts that are gonna go on from what's going on. And obviously you've got to be able to send the laser signal around this triangle both in both directions. And in fact, it's complicated to do that because you need telescopes on the satellite that point at the other satellite and you know, send and receive the signal and so forth. So those last two technologies have not been demonstrated yet, even though there are people that have ideas on how to do that. And there are also two consortiums of people in China who have proposed to build such a satellite. And I tried to get them to merge with, with LISA, but the Chinese Academy of Sciences wants to build their own. Uh, they have, you know, pressure from the highest level to do some really spectacular space stuff. So they're going to build one at some time, although probably no sooner than LISA. Okay, so how is this going to do? Well, advanced LIGO is shown on the right at high frequencies. So this is frequency versus the characteristic strain you can see. And ELISA, which was the European alone, and LISA, which is European plus US collaboration uh, and, the, and the configuration would have the, the sensitivity uh, shown below it. And there you, you're going to be able to see the supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies when galaxies merge. Eventually the black holes come together and make binary 
pairs and you can see them and you can see them across the entire universe. There's, there's no horizon for how far you can see them except the beginning of the universe itself. Right, and up in the upper left is the, you know, the pulsar timing array, the kind of thing you can get from that. And then CMB is way off the, up, to the, up to the left in terms of what can going on. And so, as I mentioned in the last lecture, if you see a large binary pair at stellar masses, you can see it for up to 10 years with LISA and predict when it will appear in the LIGO or the Einstein telescope band. Uh, quite some time ahead and predicted to win better than a day. And that, that means you can coordinate some of these kinds of things. But there are a number of things that you can do when these detectors come on, but they, they work in different regimes and only sometimes that they overlap or uh, do things together. But as I say, this is not until 2035 approximately. Okay, so let's go back to the issues of the, the data that were just released uh, and what have we seen and what have we learned. And uh, it was released uh, roughly the 28th, although I didn't notice it. Uh, one, of the, one of my students actually noticed it a little sooner than I did. But on, on the Day of the Dead, I got to see the new one, which I will show you. But here are the masses of the stellar graveyard, which we know without uh, the gravitational wave events. So electromagnetically, we see a lot of neutron stars. Those are the endpoints of, of stellar evolution up, up to a reasonable point. And a number of black holes, which are also seen electromagnetically. And they're seen a number of different ways. They're seen as being in binaries and there's an accretion disk. And the accretion disk is causing jets or causing uh, outbursts but also you can see the effect on the orbiting star. And so from both of those, we are able to determine a set of masses and so on. Now they're displayed in this funny way. That's just because the person who made this play uh, wants to do it, whatever. Now you'll see why I showed it this way. I'll show there's a mass gap here. And in theory, by stellar theory, there should be a mass gap from, you know, from 40 solar masses up to about 160. And uh, above that is the intermediate black hole mass. Okay, so here is the, here's the data again. Then after the first run, and then after the second run, and now after the release of 3A. And you can see there's a big change. First, you only had three events, and two of them are pretty much like the other stuff, and the third one was a little different. Then when you had the 11 events, it's a pretty, obvious that there's some heavier mass black holes showing up that we don't know why. But now when you have 50 events, there's a lot of really heavy solar mass black holes. So the question is, what does this all mean? Okay, so here are the first three events. And you can see the two of them on the right hand side, pretty much you could have lived with and you said, well, it's not so different from what we're seeing. The third one over on the left there is kind of heavy but it's below what we thought was our theoretical limit on what they could be. So it's possible that it's just an accident with only three events, but that there are some events like that out there and this just happened to be one that showed up. But then after we had the second run, there's a bunch of events up there. So there's a question, where are these heavier events coming from that we don't see electromagnetically, but somehow show up in the gravity waves, right? Well. As I said, it's gotten to be much more of an issue now. There is a whole lot of stuff with masses in the range 20 to 40 solar masses. And there's a bunch of stuff, there's a few of them with masses well above 40, getting into a range where you have to really do something to our understanding of stars, or you have to put in primordial black holes, or you have to do something dramatic, or you have to reinterpret the, the you know, the LIGO Virgo events in some other way. So that's part of the issue about what's going on now. We make a transmission, transition from the discovery, for well, the two discoveries that LIGO was designed to, to do. And now we're in the regime where we're testing general relativity and we're starting to understand about what happens to the stars in their lifetime. Okay, so let me go through three events 
In particular, I'll spend most of the event, most of the time on event two, because that's what I spent, I've been thinking about a lot, but spend more time making slides for. Okay, so the first one is event called Gravity Wave 1908-14. That's uh, 2019, eighth month, 14th day and has one object with a mass between two and five, the mass times the mass of the sun. That's in a region in which we thought was a mass gap, that, that neutron stars didn't exist with masses above two solar masses, and that there is no stellar evolution that leads to black holes whose mass is less than five. And so we'll have to see that. Then we'll talk about the really heavy event, the, the most heavy one, the 1905-21, which also was released, before, the data was released before the observing run 3A was. And then um, briefly about gravity wave 1904-12, which is a large asymmetry between the masses. What are these unusual events? Do we take them at face value or do we think maybe they should be interpreted differently? And this is, this is the issue and the transition you have when you move from discoveries actually seeing things where you design the machine to look for certain discoveries when you start finding additional things are you are you getting the right data and the right interpretation or do you need to revise your thoughts on that okay so we're talking about this first event the 814 the mass gap event here are the data the the light blue line is the detector data and over on the right hand side, you see roughly the level of the noise. You see a reconstructed waveform by fitting template uh, wave, wavelets to it, and then also by fitting a template from numerical relativity. That is, you have a you do calculations of of various masses and various spins and various orientations uh, orbiting each other, and then radiating gravity waves, and then merging. And you have an array of that and you fit, you see how things go. And then you make an interpolation and that's the curve you come up with. Okay, and on the right hand side is the data. And one of the things you'll see, and I could see if I could, if, if the panel wasn't over the top of it, the Livingston data is obviously much better than the Hanford and the Virgo data. And that is because Livingston was able to successfully make its upgrades, whereas Hanford only made some of them and had to step back. And then Virgo has been behind schedule and it will take more years for it to catch up. But it also is just because it's three kilometers instead of four kilometers, it's gonna be somewhat less sensitive. Okay, so here's the fact sheet they hand out. It's like chemistry fact sheets for this event. It was, uh, you know, when it was observed, it's uh, you know, listed as a black hole in a compact object. And the reason it's a black hole is one of them is a 23 solar masses. So, we don't know of anything but black holes that could be small and be 23 solar masses. So it's given the designated. Now at 2.3 solar masses, well, maybe there could be something else, but it's it's getting the limit of what you think is even possible with, with neutron stars. And uh, you think it should be a black hole, but you don't know, you don't know where it comes from. So it's unusual in that it's asymmetric in masses. There are very few events, and I'll show you data later on. There are very few events in which mass one and mass two are very different. In fact, they tend to correlate very highly. Okay, so this is the event on that stellar graveyard plot, highlighted with the light color. So it's coming out of this region, which we thought was the mass gap, and it's coming up uh, and merging with a relatively heavy back hole, the one on the the, the, the blue thing on the left of, of that event and becoming a slightly heavier black hole right? and the rest coming off in gravity waves. And so, well, it could be, it could be that stars made of that, or it could be this was two neutron stars that merged and later they got to be with a black hole. And it's a probability kind of estimate thing. How likely is it for two neutron stars to merge? And then that one find itself a black hole to merge with, and then they merge, right? So that's, it becomes, what are the different possible ways you could get an event like this? And what are the relevant probabilities of the relevant 
things that you could do to test to see what would distinguish them. So this is one of the sort of strange new events that causes you to ask questions either about stellar theory or about how they're interpreting or making the observations or what's really out there. So we'll, 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 we'll see about that. So here uh, is a plot that shows you something about what's known about neutron stars and black holes before this event. On the top left, there's the thing they labeled NS, it's a little histogram, which is the known neutron stars. And it's on a log plot. So most of the known neutron stars are down around 1.2 solar masses with a little tail that sticks up uh, to just above two, right? And then there are black holes that start at about five and go on up. So we not only had a theory gap, but we actually had an observational gap. Below you'll see is a model where there is rapid supernova and they lead automatically to that mass gap and a steep fall down in the number of neutron stars. And a delayed one, which people are proposing for binary stars, where the infalling material delays the supernova and uh, so it goes on and produces a, a sort of a fill-in. I'll show you another plot of that. And so one of the problems we have is if you're a physics student, one of the things you're taught is to estimate the Chandrasekhar mass, which is a neutron star has a maximum mass, which we thought was primarily set by the, the uncertainty principle by quantum mechanics uh, that the neutron stars can't, the neutrons can't occupy the same state. And so when they get above a certain mass, they become energetically favorable for them to collapse to a black hole rather than that. And that's a little over 1.4 uh, solar masses. That's that red spot on there. And yet we see neutron stars that exist with masses up to about 2.1. So the question is, how do they do that? Is there some equation of state that's keeping them from doing it? So one of the things that you look at when the neutron stars merge is the, you know, how much material gets turned off and then how much they bounce before they merge. And then eventually collapse to a black hole or whatever they do, starts telling you about the neutron star equation of state. But another piece of information that's sort of relevant, as you see in the upper left, uh, I have this thing coming here. On the upper left, a blue histogram, which is the masses of the neutron stars and double neutron stars. And then in red, the masses of neutron stars that are in other binary systems, white dwarfs or main sequence stars. And you'll notice when it's a double neutron star, they sort of peak around, you know, 1.3, 1.35 solar masses, fairly narrow distribution. Whereas for the other ones, they're spread quite a lot. Now, that could be from any number of reasons. But if you look at the two events that, that the LIGO Virgo you know, collaboration has, that you will see that one event falls right in the neutron star, neutron star usual category, and one event falls in the mixed category. And uh, so the question is, what does that mean? What have we learned from that? So I didn't mention, you know, the first in the first two observing runs, they did see a neutron star, neutron star in observing run two, just after Virgo had turned on, and that turned out to be critical to identify it optically. Um, the, uh, you know, it makes a lot of sense and we understand it. The new one that came along was not identified optically and identified cleanly enough, but it falls in this other area. There should have been light from it. It's a question of whether, whether it was actually located, localized well enough. So why is it like that? You know, and if there's only two events, you can't see whether that distribution that you see in black is, is the, the kind of distribution you're getting or whether it's, uh, you know, something else. But, you know, as, as the system gets better, there'll be more events and this will be, be tested. Okay, so now I want to talk a fair amount of time because this illustrates a lot and shows you uh, an interpretation error and but we don't know whether it's actually wrong or not. It's just that there are lots of other things. So here on that same plot, the, the, all the events from observing one, one 
observing runs one and two, plus the couple of events that were put out, like the asymmetric one, uh, I mean, the, uh, the mass gap event, plus this really heavy event where one of the masses is 66 solar mass and the other is 84, and they merge to form something that's up near 150. And this is uh, known as the big one, but this is the one that is claimed to be the, the first observation of an immediate black hole. Okay, so what does that mean? Okay, so now I extend the stellar graveyard, uh, but it's not really stellar graveyard, it's, it's a compact object uh, kind of operation. There is, at very low masses, the things like white dwarfs and, and neutron stars, and then there's the stellar black holes, and then there are the LIGO Virgo black holes. There is then the thing called intermediate black holes, that is stuff above 100 solar masses, but less than 10 to the fifth. And there are supermassive black holes. One of the one half of the Nobel Prize this year went to the proof that the black hole that in the center of our galaxy is a black hole, and it has a mass that's roughly four times some of the six solar masses. Okay, so. Virgo's reported these black hole mergers. This remnant is well above 100 solar masses. So they claim it's the first one. And the primary mass lies outside of the stellar graveyard. In fact, both of them lie out, well outside of the stellar graveyard. So where did this guy come from? That's the big question. Okay, so why is that so important? So here's another way of looking at that. Okay, if you look at the compact object in the, in the so forth. On the left, on the plot, and sort of the dark blue, is where the neutron stars and the white dwarfs and so forth would be. Then there is a gap. And then, uh, I'm sorry, is there a message for me? Or, I don't know. There is, there is a gap where you expect to be uh, nothing, and then stellar mass uh, black holes. And there's a thing we'll talk about, which is called the pair instability and mass gap, which kicks in somewhere about 40 uh, solar masses and extends out above 100. And then there's a region that astronomers have labeled immediate black holes and then supermassive black holes. And as I said, Sagittarius A is Sagittarius, Sagittarius A star is the place in the center of the galaxy where we think the supermassive black hole is. And that Reinhard Gensel and Andrea Getz shared the, half the Nobel Prize for showing there was something that was very compact, caused some stars to be moving at relative six speeds, orbiting it, and has approximate mass of 10, 4 10 to the 6 solar masses. Right? <clears throat> and people wondered, where do supermassive black holes come from? And some theorists have speculated there must be intermediate blast mass black holes that kind of accrete and merge in order to do that. So this one has a primary with a mass of 85 solar masses approximately, and the merger is 142, depending on how you, how you do this kind of stuff. So what's going on with this event? Okay, so I, I hearken back to a talk that I went to long ago. In 2011, uh, Shira Paschuk, I don't know if I said his name right or properly, showed this plot in which he showed the in the red, you see the neutron stars, those are compact objects, and also lower red black hole candidates, things that were expected to be black hole candidates as measured by the x-rays. And you look at it and he says, it seems to be strange because the number of stars in the galaxies, the progenitors of black holes with mass 30, greater than 30, is strongly increasing with decreasing of their masses, right? That is, the number goes down as the fifth, one over the fifth power of the mass. So you just don't expect there to be that many really massive black holes, and yet somehow they're finding a bunch. Right? So what does that mean? So that was a prediction or a discussion way, you know, five years before any observations were made by, any detections were made by, by LIGO. Okay, so now you can also look at this plot uh, and in hashed red, you see the observed stellar mass uh, black holes uh, observed in the Milky Way. And then you see 
the first LIGO events. And then the, the, everything was released prior to the release of, of Observing Run 3A, including the three events that, that, that we are talking about now. So the question is, are they the same distributions? And the answer is, they don't look like the same distribution, but LIGO is more sensitive by the, the you know, the five halves power to, with, of the mass. So if there was a long tail, maybe, but not, it's tough to make it be consistent. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the pair instability mass gap. Uh, okay, so pair instability is when you get, I'll go, I'll just show the thing here. There's, there should be a gap in the range from 65 to 125 solar masses where a star can't form a black hole. And the reason for that is when you get a parent that's, that's heavy enough to make one, you're gonna blow off the outer shell and then the rest is gonna clamp back to form a black hole. The, any oscillations on the star able to drive pair production in the center of the star because the pressure and the temperature are so high and so great that you can easily make pairs. That makes the equation of state soft and that means it oscillates at a bigger rate. Because it does that, you can have high, the, it drives the temperature up and so forth. You can have high nuclear rates and do carbon and oxygen burning and create an, it, it causes both either a blow off of the outer shell and, and get rid of a lot of, of evolution or immediately causes a supernova that blows off a lot of stuff. And, but generally you expect it to end up to create the collapse of the hydrogen envelope that has blown the hydrogen away and do a lot of kind of things. So this becomes a challenge for a stub revolution if LIGO is really finding events in this mass. So here's some more about it. Here's the, the, that same curve on the left of showing the number of events that were published at that time with the two masses and then in red and black and then of the of the two that are going to merge and then in red the merged result and on the right is the uh, the mass of the progenitor star at uh, at the zero time and then you pry different amount of materials in it what astronomers call metallicity that's just how much the material in the star has evolved. Is it primordial or has it evolved way up to the same level as the sun has? The sun is second or third generation star. It's, it's already using the heavier elements, relatively heavier elements that were made in the previous generation of the star. And that includes the, you know, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, silicon, and so forth. And so if you, if you have, uh, heavier elements in the envelope of a star, you blow away more of the surface of the star because there are more things interact with the photon and therefore the photon pressure can blow it away. So you want to get to as primordial material as you can in order to get to the maximum, you know, remnant mass in the end. So you can see that it's done in terms of uh, the stellar evolution and the lower you are in terms of evolved material, the, the higher you go. But you still have a problem getting up in the range above 50 solar masses. And for most of these models, 40 solar masses is about the maximum. So you, you, you have a problem. How do you make these heavy stars that, 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 that LIGO Virgo uh, collaboration is claiming to see? So again, Here's more detail. Now we're generating papers where people are trying to figure out ways to put stuff in the mass gap. This is one that was focused on the lower mass gap. So you're going to have a remnant of a white dwarf and neutron star of a black hole, as far as you know in stellar evolution. Those are the endpoints. So on the bottom left, you see a box which is then stretched out where you see where the mass of the progenitor star is running uh, running up from five to 30, 20 solar masses. And you see, you expect it to be, you know, a white dwarf or a neutron star, as long as there is just a stream, straightforward supernova. 
And then depending on the metallicity, that is whether it's solar metallicity, you only get up to like 20 solar masses uh, at the maximum situation, no matter what mass you started with. Or if you get down to very low metallicity, you can get up to about 40 solar masses. And now what happens if you make it delayed? And when they say delayed, they don't mean delayed a lot. They mean instead of 10 milliseconds, it's like 200 milliseconds. And that there is a bi you're in a binary and there is infall transfer from one member of the binary to the other. And that slows down the onset of the burning for the supernova. And uh, that then allows more material to fall in between. And then you their claim is you can kind of fill the mass gap. So between those two, the rapid and the delayed, there are a bunch of horizontal lines. Those are the measured masses from LIGO Virgo events that were that were released. And what you can see is down at the bottom, there's some yellow ones and they find they fit right in the, you know, either kind of stellar evolution. There's one that fits in the gap, right? And then there's a bunch that go in where they're supposed to be in the stellar mass, but then they're good to be by the time you get up to the blues and the lots of stuff and the dashed lines, there's a whole lot of stuff that's above where you think most stars can do it, unless you get, you know, first generation stars to do it. That's a question, where are we gonna find that much material of first generation stars, especially of really large masses? So again, there's a question of where do these guys come from? Okay, so here's the fact sheet for, you know, just like your chemical data sheet, the fact sheet for uh, 1905-21. And uh, you can see it was discovered on May 21st and 2019. It's quite a distance away, 17 billion light years. It's quite far. It's a redshift of, of uh, 0.8. The mass ratio of light to small is 0.8. And the remnant, they claim, is 142. And the bottom left, you can see one mass plotted against the other mass in an histogram. And you see it's kind of oval shaped, and then there's a cutoff because you define M1 as being heavier than M2. And so you can't, you can't cross that in the unshaded area, right? And so if you look at it, though, it's kind of oval shaped. If you imagine it flipped around, that means there's a correlation between if one mass is fitted a little high, the other mass is fitted a little low. The sum of the masses is more precisely determined than just adding them in quadrature what I'm giving you because that is consistent with the signal you get. And you can also look at something we'll talk about a little bit more, which is the spin in the, in the other black uh, areas, the spin plotted against the remnant black hole fitting mass. And you can see the spin is kind of up around 0.7, right? And that's 0.7 of the maximal spin that a curved rotating black hole can have. And so that's relevant because what you'll see is that when you just merge two non-spinning black holes, that's the typical spin you're going to get. If you have spins, then it depends on whether they're aligned or disaligned. And that's, the, that's the, a key test. So the fact that it's coming out like that is telling you something about what the origin might be of this, of this event. OK, so let's talk about the spin. Here is in more detail is the spin. Okay, so on the left is a plot of the probability of the spin and its angle. So the magnitude is pointing in one direction. And uh, so the magnitude that's darkest is further out. So it's fairly large magnitude. And then tilt. So the tilt, the zero that's on the top, that's when the spin of the black holes are pointing in the same direction as they're orbiting. That's what you'd expect for a commonly involved binary pair. And uh, then horizontally is 90 degrees away. That is laying basically in the plane of the orbit. And then all the way at the bottom is pointing the opposite direction as it's been flipped over compared to the orbit. And what you can see is it's tipped over at least on the scale about 90 degrees, or 80 to 90 degrees. And when you look at the plots of this effective spin, right, versus the, the spin of the pieces, what you find is it's really consistent with zero effective spin to begin with, 
and and an average spend, which is about uh, in the 0.7 to 0.8 range, which is what you expect for essentially zero spend uh, black holes or randomly spend black holes merging together. And that's that's the question. Not only we have enough statistics, but because you know, if this is made out of of what is proposed, then you would expect it to be different. So here's another uh, another plot that tells you the mass, the best fitted mass versus the final spin, and so forth. So there's two ideas of how these heavy mass binary black hole pairs could be created. One is field binary evolution. That is, in, in isolation in, the, in the, the galactic field, the binary star system are, form independently, and they, you know, they, they remain together and, and end up as a binary pair. And this is tricky because when the first black hole appears, even though it should have close to zero spin, it gets a kick. It's just like neutron stars get a kick when they're formed. Typically a kick that's between 100 kilometers per second and 1,000 kilometers per second. Here you need the kick to be small because you need it to stay in the binary pair and have the other uh, element of the binary pair go on and finish and become a black hole. And so the spins will be moderately, because of the stuff that's thrown out and because of what goes on, the spins should be moderately well aligned to the orbit. And the final one should be closely. The other approach that people have is dynamical assembly. The black holes are, are formed independently and they wander around to find another black hole and make a pair. That doesn't happen so often out in the general galaxy and certainly not in the void of space. But if you have a, a high stellar density, like a globular cluster or the center of the galaxy, then because they're heavy, they tend to go to the center. They tend to pair up, kicking out the lighter ones. When they get formed together, then they often get kicked out. And here, the spins will be randomly aligned to the orbit. And therefore, uh, you will make predictions about how the spins should line up. OK, so here's the idea. That this is a drawing the, the LIGO team put out, the LIGO Virgo team put out. They imagine two sort of stellar mass black holes or, or heavy stellar mass black holes merged together to make an 85 solar mass one, and two others merged together to make a 66 solar mass, and they merged together to make 142. Okay, well, then both of these should have around 70 to 80, you know, 70, 75 percent spins, and then those spins. Uh, are either going to be, you know, randomly aligned to each other or, or uh, into the orbit direction or, or some other way. And so the question is, what does the data tell us? Well, the data isn't sufficient quite to distinguish them, but it, it does tell you there's something going on. Okay, so in this dynamical scenario, you get higher logical mergers. There's a first generation of black holes that merge and make a second generation. They're going to make typically with a spin just from the angular momentum, the spin of that second generation black hole is going to be around 0.7. And then that one is going to merge with some other black holes. And again, they're going to get about 0.7 and so on. And so in this kind of a scenario, the you know, GW, uh, you know, the, the this the you know 521 is going to be second, third, or fourth generation merger. That's, that's, you know, we used to have this thing, say, in physics, you know, it's better if you just explain it right away, but you're allowed to have one tooth fairy. That is, you only have to have one magic thing you call upon. If you have to have two magic things happen, the odds are not in your favor, right? And so here, you've got to come up with a careful scheme about how this could come into being. Okay, and so here are, you know, candidates. These people used to be favoring the uh, what's called a common spin. I mean, that's a common envelope binary. And uh, they, that is, you have, a, you have a black hole that formed and eventually the, the other star swells up as it gets older so that they have a common love. They, they merge together, they share, you know, they become a binary pair, they share, the, the other star evolves and becomes a black hole, and then you have them in a, in a and a uh, relatively small orbit pair of black holes that can then 
radiated away and merge. So these these three people happen to actually be advocates of that. But recently they they just come out with a paper saying, let's imagine that we have two situations, one where there are equal masses, one where they're the standard mass, which I'll show you, ratio, which is about 0.7 if you take lighter to smaller or 1.4 if you take it the other way around. And consider the case, which is the, the green and blue line uh, when there's no spin, because they use A for spin, just like some people use Q as one over Q and so on. And then the other one for when you have essentially maximal spin, the red curves for maximal spin, when you have uh, you know the ratios. And what you see, it doesn't really matter Somehow you expect the, per, the spin parameter to end up in the sort of the 0.7 something range in terms of what should, what should be the end result of merging. And that's because you're, you're merging them and you're merging them again and again. And it randomizes and becomes like you had zero spin uh, coming together and it's just the orbital angular momentum coming, coming out of the system. Okay, so here's another example. I'm sorry, I have these two slides in reverse order. This shows you the curve for second generation and then third generation and then fourth generation. It peaks up till you get up to that 0.7 something for your typical value. Okay, so there are alternative scenarios that 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 they pushed to the push to the side, but where it could be that this event was a heavy a head-on collision or very eccentric merger. And that's extremely rare because they think that would happen in a star cluster. And then the, you know, what are the chances of them hitting basically head on? And the answer is small, but it could happen, right? So, and then you could say, well, it's a core collapse supernova. Well, it's inconsistent with the way the signal looks uh, and there was no neutrino. Well, I, I think they're a little casual about it. You could say, well, it's primordial black holes. That doesn't have the problem of stellar evolution, you know, making this evolutionary Theorists have to make up whole new models and how things work, and uh, it's it's possible, you know, it may be that even though we can show that primordial black holes are no more than a very small fraction of the, you know, less than four or five percent of the dark matter, it's possible that primordial black holes could exist, and they could be sufficient number to to, to show up at an event like that. It's a little difficult to constrain right now, but as more data come in over the next couple of years, it should be quite possible to rule that out really cleanly. Okay, and they also wave away strong gravitational lensing, and they you'll we'll come back to this because this is one alternative so that my colleagues and I suggest. There's a low expected lensing weight, so the optical depth for getting a magnification of 10 or so is on your 10 to minus three to 10 to minus four for these kinds of events. And that is true, and I'll show you why. And then they dismiss it, uh, but in fact, that's a mistake to dismiss it, and I'll show you why in a little bit. So the absence of identified uh, multiple counterparts, that is multiple lensing counterpart, that is my, my colleagues and I have proposed that there is, there is a one case that you see, you see the event with two, you know, with two images and you don't see it, the actual images because you don't have the angular resolution, but you see a time delay between them. So they claim there's no evidence in favor of strong lensing. I say there's no evidence against it either, but we'll see. And then they say, what about cosmic strings? Because you can get gravity waves if cosmic strings have a cusp or a kink in them, and it can be quite a powerful burst. And it's very, it's very focused like a jet. And so they're claiming it doesn't fit the data very well. And I, I'll come back to that. I don't think they can rule it out very strongly yet, but they, they don't care for those. Okay, so now here's the first example I have of where, though they built a tremendous machine to uh, make these measurements, and you often do that, and you build an accelerator to discover the Higgs, and you discover the Higgs, well, you get the Nobel Prize for that, but you get to discover other things if you're paying attention. Okay, so on the bottom of the LIGO Virgo results, fitting a plot of them, M2 versus M1, and uh, the overall mass times the ratio, but now it's one over Q of the other guys, right? So the ratio is bigger than one instead of less than one. And here's an alternate set of data analysis done by outside people. Uh, 
it's marked on here, Nitz and Kapana, uh, where they extended the priors. That is, you know, in LIGO, when they fit to the events, they put in a Bayesian priors on what events they're looking for. And sometimes that Bayesian prior is very severe. Namely, they don't fit a mass ratio bigger than six. Okay, well, look at the one right above where the 11 is. That's the LIGO Virgo results. And just above that is extending the mass ratio up to 20. And you will see, they see the same two peaks, even though LIGO Virgo picked the bottom peak, which is lower than the top peak. But there is a third peak, which is much stronger, which is at a mass ratio of around 12. And that's with a, with a M1, which is around 170, 160 something. And uh, another mass, which is around 12 to 15. And so what does this mean? Well, this means they're only looking where their flashlight is. They, they have a huge array of models and they fit templates only to the models that uh, are in their template, which they chose, you know, during the time they're building, upgrading the equipment and they're upgrading the analysis. And one of the things they're doing is making a huge array of numerical relativity simulations of waveforms to fit the models with. And what they do is the mic that array takes a huge amount of time and computing power. And so they've chosen which areas to be looking and they haven't been looking for this kind of an area. So you could say, if you believe that Nitz and Capano did a good job, that it's a much better fit to have a big mass ratio here. And so I'll talk about a little bit more about what that means. But what this does is say, oh, wait a minute, I better go back and look at their data and see over what parameter space are they looking? Because they basically put one priority in, which is if, if it's not falling in the right mass ratio, I'm not even looking for it. But they also, in the early days, didn't look for things in certain mass ranges because they didn't build templates for those. And over time, as they saw heavier mass things, they started extending up in mass. And so you will see there is there's a prejudice. And this, is, this shows you two examples of, of doing science, one of which is you design an instrument to look for some exciting signal or for some strong test of science you want to do, and you do a brilliant job, and that's great because you do it. But then you have to be careful as new data and additional data come in that you are not so biased that you fail to see what the new thing is. Okay. So I claim you have to look more carefully at these data and realize that they have arbitrarily made a cutoff. Now they're doing they're doing a really impressive job. But the fact is, you can't just take the data and assume it's right. So I'm going to get control of the screen again. OK, so you should have looked first. This is the other thing I try and teach my students. Look at the data before you start doing anything. Here's the actual data for that event. Okay. The most that it could be, now the question is, where is the merger? Well, the merger is somewhere near the peak amplitude in that region in the center of the plot. And you can see there's no more than about two to three, two and a half, three orbits before it merges. And you look down on the chirp plot, and it's just a little blob. Even in the, in the Livingston uh, thing, which has the best signal noise, you really don't see the chirp. You just see kind of a blob, a hint of a chirp, but that's not much. So you got to be very careful when your data is very limited and you're not searching over the larger database. That it could be a much different kind of event than what you think it is. Okay, so here's the, the fact sheet again. I'm trying to remember why I put it in again. I must have been, I'm sorry, I was making this talk sort of half an hour before, the, still making it during that time. And apparently I put this in a different place. Oh no, this is a different one. I got the wrong fact sheet on the left. On the right is 19401. 401 something, I can't read it because it's blocked on my screen, uh, which is the, the uh, um, let me see, sorry, which is the third event that I was talking about of very unequal masses, right? And it turns out there are three or four events with very unequal masses that I think have possible different interpretation than what they do. 
And so we'll have to, we'll get into that. Okay, so oops, here are the grant masses in the graveyard again, but somehow offset. Switching computers has been a problem here. Okay, so let's look back at the known masses in the graveyard, and there's four different views. The main, the first view I've been showing you is the aesthetic one, and uh, it's made to be nice and symmetric, and put the, the LIGO stuff originally in the center, but then it grew to be all the top, right? So now we're going to look at the scientific category view. There's three different views here. Okay, so the, the scientific category view is that, that uh, and includes the error bars on the masses. So on the vertical scale is the mass. On the horizontal scale is just event number basically, but ranked by the mass. And so for the neutron stars, there are neutron stars that have been discovered as bursters. There's sort of a nice rising relationship. There are the slow pulsars that are more steeply rising. The recycled pulsars, right? And you can see it's flatter, it's more peaked, and so on. Likewise, you can see the galactic black holes. So far, all the known galactic black holes have been discovered by, uh, by electromagnetism. There's a few extra galactic, but mostly in the local group, large magnetic cloud and so forth, of electromagnetically discovered black holes. And then the LIGO Virgo uh, black holes. Sorry, I can't quite see all my view graphs because of the the panel showing up. Um, the, here we are now with them all together ranked with the error bars on it and you can see that plus you can see the two uh, Virgo mass neutron stars in there and where we think there's a mass gap and then the, the, the uh, black hole mass is continuing up. Okay and then you can do it on a linear scale. So generally, I'll show you the large scale has a lot of advantage in this kind of a thing, but there are some times where the linear scale gives you a different kind of view. And there you can see the neutron star mass range is quite small. It is, in percentage, it's roughly the same size, but in terms of actual amount, it's very small. And there's only a small gap where the mass gap is in comparison to the scale in which you're talking about. But what does that really mean? Well, it means it's a break because now I'm going to start talking about even more speculative stuff. So here's the aliens watching out from the black hole traffic sign and being uh, suckered in by the black hole. Okay, so I want to talk about explaining the LIGO Virgo events as gravitationally lens magnified stellar mass black holes at cosmological distances or other things. So my colleagues and I, Tom Broadhurst, Jose Maria Diego, we have actually four papers on it. I mentioned two papers here. And that is, you don't have any way to understand where the black hole really is, right? The, the, some members of the LIGO team particularly, but some of the Virgo too, really say we have a standard candle because we just measure the strain mental so far away is. Well, the gravitational waveform doesn't provide a measurement of the redshift Z. It gives you the strain, but if there is gravitational lensing, it's then projected. It takes something at a greater distance and divides the, obvious, the apparent distance by the square root of the magnification, or magnifications and set by optical astronomy, which is luminosity magnification. And there's a simple formula for this, which has to do with the chirp mass, which is, you know, made up of various geometric products of the, of the two masses, uh, a thing that has to do with the, the time and the angles of the orbit and the spin and so forth. And uh, so we, uh, and that gives you the local strain. So since gravitation is scale free, gravity waves from a local binary with masses M1 and M2 are indistinguishable from masses M1 divided by one over one plus C. Uh, or an M2 divided by one plus Z, at a redshift Z, and except for the magnitude, but the magnification can bring that magnitude right back. Okay, so what magnification do we need for a signal noise of 10 with a chirp mass of eight? And the answer is during observing runs in one and two is the upper curve, right? So you need to have 
even to get a redshift of one, you need a magnification of about 100. But for observing run 3A, you only, you can get out to a redshift of two and a half with a magnification of 100. And with observing run three, with a big trip mass of 35, which is 240 by 40 solar mass ones, you could get all the way out to redshift of four with a magnification. Well, you know, they told you already that's below 10 to the minus four. I'll tell you it's even worse than that. If you look out for a magnification here of, of, uh, of 100, you're basically out of 10 to the minus six, right? Another one here where it's carefully simulated and ray traced. And again, if you want to get out to a magnification of 100, you're basically got it roughly about a chance of a million. Now, if you need to get a magnification of 10, you're down at the 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4. So, wow, well, that's, that's not very likely, right? And Virgo's in the LIGO Virgo team guys say we can ignore it because it's it's less than important, uh, you know, a thousand, certainly maybe less than 10,000. And the answer to that is you forget about the Malmquist bias. So astronomy is the field in which you can sometimes be more famous for the errors you find than for the whatever. So on the left side is a simple explanation of Monquist that's almost right. So on the bottom axis, this is the distance. And on the vertical axis is the luminosity. The luminosity is the energy per unit, era, unit time per area, right? And so if you don't have any evolution, you have equal density of stars in every volume and uh, equal distribution of brightness, then you will find just because you have a cutoff and how far you can see stars and resolve them and measure their luminosity, that the average luminosity for that volume is lower than the luminosity, the average luminosity of the visible stars. Now, if this plot was right, the number of stars would be increasing to the right, the same way the curve is increasing to the right. It's just one, of, it's one over R squared and, and in terms of the area. And as you go out, you get more and more area and therefore you get more and more volume of stars. Okay, on the right-hand side, I have shown a plot of the luminosity, the log of the luminosity of galaxies from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And then a line to help guide the eye of the luminosity cutoff, which is going to be proportional to one over the distance squared. The luminosity is falling over one off is one over the density square. It's going to be a cut. There should be a distribution. If there's no evolution, there should be a distribution that's horizontal. And then I put a cut in. There's another cut to the right, which is partially selection of the data. And that's why the red line is, shows the cut where you don't use the data anymore. But with LIGO, not only do we have a cut, but it's not a luminosity cut, it's a strain cut. The strain is, you know, how much the, 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 the mirrors are moved back and forth. So it's a square root of the luminosity, basically. So it falls down as one over the distance. So the slope is one instead of two. And it's set at an extremely high level. That is, unless you get very close to the Earth, you can't see these events, they're below threshold. Okay, so now you have this distribution, and I imagine it extends horizontally across here. And now I'm gonna throw in lensing. I have millions of galaxies, millions of these events occurring over time, and I'm gonna throw in lensing, and I'm gonna lens one in a few thousand uh, or 20,000 up by a factor of 10, to a factor of 100. Now, the number of points that are above the line, some are going to be real events with very few because it's exponentially or Gaussianly falling off, but some are going to be thrown up there because of gravitational lensing, and you'll be able to see them. So it's not surprising that when I look out for the most bright things, especially at distances, the most things I'm going to see are going to be gravitationally lensed even though the chances of any one individual thing being gravitational lens is small, it's those tiny fraction that are lens that then are then detectable. And this is, this is the case uh, that, that we kind of know about. So this is why you can't just say it's only a chance of a thousand or a chance of 10,000, and therefore we can neglect it. It's because you didn't say, what are the chances the ones that are above this high level and have this high apparent mass 
or lens, the probability is much, much higher. And so then it becomes a number, you know, what are the different approaches? And so there's another factor that goes on, not only is the volume increasing as you go out, but we know that if you go back, there's a star formation rate, that is the stars that form and then eventually find, become these black holes. The star formation rate increases by more than a magnitude from the present time back to a redshift of, of, of one and uh, peaking around two. And if you look at what the modified is, because you've got to do it in such a place that you can get two black holes together and so forth, it can be a much bigger factor. And so, and if you're one of my colleagues, you could even fudge the data to make it look like this, which we did to try and do some more fits. And that's our weakness that we need the binary black hole formation rate to be significantly higher in order to be explain what a big fraction of the data need to be lensed. Okay, now here's another plot. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, like in a, a lot of people in astronomy plant, things backwards or upside down to other people. Here we have M2 versus M1 instead of M1 versus M2 that was on the other plot. And here there are things with dots on them. Those are black hole, black hole pairs, with a square in the center. And there are things with triangles or rhomboids, sorry, with error bars on them. Those are also like overgrow events. And then there are circles that are either, either basically black or all the way green and red. And those are Monte Carlo simulation of events that we would predict uh, for our eventsing uh, kind of configuration. And we predict there should be two lines that things follow if we're making them only on a stellar mass black holes or on a neutron star by black holes that are stellar mass black holes. So there's a dash line on the upper left, which is the neutron black hole line for lensing where you go from lensing with, with uh, you know, essentially unity lensing up to where you have a very high lensing. You know, unfortunately, it's redshift here, some of the plots have, I have the pencil on you take. And so I have circled on the right is the gravity wave 90.0412 and gravity wave 19.0814. Those are the two that are asymmetric and one that's a mass gap. And you can see, well, if I take a neutron star at 1.4 solar masses and put it at a redshift of one, it'll look like it has 2.8 solar masses. Huh, fits just perfectly, and so on. So it's not out of the woods that these could be lensed because you have to do it. But you know, you have to say, well, how many, how many neutron star black holes should there be compared to how many black hole black holes? Well, there are more neutron stars than there are black holes, and the number of neutron star pairs should be the maximum, except they have such a small signal we can't see them very far. But neutron star black holes should be as much as an order of magnitude more common than black hole black holes. So it's, uh, you know, the fact that we so many, see so many black hole black holes is another thing. But let me show you this plot again before you get too bored. So here's a plot where the advantage of log log is. It? But here again, it's log of of M1 versus M2, okay? So there's a line, the lower line is the line on the log log plot where M1 equals M2. The next line up is a plot where M1 equals 1.4 M2 or Q equals 0.7 in the one, in the one example we gave you or 1.4 in the other example. And at the very top of it near where the arrow is pointing is that really, Extraordinarily massive event, the, the 521, 1905-21. And you can interpret that as being over, way over to the left, where I put that sun, right? And over there is a band, which is the band that I put on there that indicates what you would expect the mass ratio range to be for a binary, uh, for black hole, the binaries that are black hole neutron stars. And you can see. Well, you might be able to explain those events, you might not. One of the problems for that super heavy guy, he's so heavy, you need to put him at a redshift of nearly nine, it's eight point something. And it's hard to see that. There's, there's rumors that as the galaxy has been discovered by gravitational lensing that could be at a redshift of 10, but we have to see 
Otherwise, there are basically not very many galaxies known that are bonded in the redshift of seven. It's very hard. You're getting back early in the universe to do that. So this would be, you know, quite an unusual event if it was back there and have that much magnification. So, but what you do see on this plot is that there is a high correlation between the black hole black hole pairs in terms of their mass, much more than you would have thought if there was a sort of a nearly flat distribution the way LIGO shows of masses for black hole. That somehow the masses know to be near each other, not exactly the same, but near each other most of the time, not for all the events. Okay, so I have some conclusions. You know, my conclusion, I didn't get a chance to clean this up much. It'd be surprising if the strain limited detection from LIGO Virgo don't contain at least 20% highly gravitationally lens events you know, mostly from beyond the unlensed detector volume. You know, if the, if the binary black holes have a similar distribution as the galactic and local, you know, black holes, then these, these local events will appear to have correlated masses and they would fall on that line that is essentially the constant ratio of masses. So that fits, but there may be other reasons why that ratio of masses is, is narrow, right? And uh, it, an easy way is what we say is it's narrow, narrow because that stellar mass black holes are narrow and you're just seeing lens versions uh, or it could be there's some other mechanism that makes it so that that the black hole uh, distribution, the black holes, you know, select partners of near equal mass, right? And so who knows? And we're going to see similar kinds of thing going on. Now as the threshold goes down, you see further out without lensing, and but you require less lensing to see it further. It's a competition between those two. It's not clear to me which way, it's, it depends on how fast the detection improves, which way the ratio of lens to unlens things will, sh will, will shift. Once you have super high sensitivities like you would get with the Einstein telescope, then you would I think the lens guys will go to be a small percentage, right? They'll go down to the, to the minus four kind of level. But before that, they're preferentially going to be high signal and they're going to show up. Okay, so here is again the log log where you can see without the, without the neutron stars, you can see a group here down around 10 solar masses, right? Which are the stellar mass black holes. And then another group, which is stretched out along here, plus this guy that's super heavy. You know, these, what are these different categories? What are these kind of events? Well, if this is the lens neutron star that black hole that explains it, this is the stellar guys, we can't understand them for solar evolution. And these guys could be lensed or these could be merged or it's gonna end up probably being some complex mixture of various things, but we can see. And here's a, on, a, on a black and white scale, so it's easier to see, but also including the two neutron star, neutron star, so you can see it. So you can see the categories. You not only see neutron star, neutron star, and stellar and conventional stellar mass, stellar mass, but you also see some heavy mass, heavy mass guys, and some asymmetric guys. And the question is, where do all these things come from? Is it really just the things we already know and love, neutron stars and stellar mass black holes, and a few merged guys, or is it something much more complicated going on? So that's a line of equality, just so you can see. Okay, so here's the observation summary, and I'm coming to the end, thank God. Um, so there were 11 detections in the observing run one and two, which is 2015 and 2017. And it was interesting, but it was very, it, it was very limited what we saw, although it was already starting to point out there was some issue with there being heavier mass. With more simulations and more data, a lot more heavy mass things showed up in the, the observing run 3A. In the observing run 3B, there are already 30 more detections. And so we don't, we don't know. We're hoping they'll release this data more quickly than it took a long time to release O3A. We're hoping to see what's going to happen. OK, so here are my conclusions. We have entered an exciting new era in gravitational wave astronomy. We have moved from the early intentional discoveries into new kind of understandings. 
now adding a new detector. Conqueror is actually working. It's being, its commission is starting to, to run, but it's not quite ready to, for observing run four yet. The detection rate is more than one every two weeks in observing run three. There was one detection every five plus weeks in observing one and two. And there will be two per week in observing run four starting in 2022. Then in 2025, another factor of four to eight, getting more than one a day in LIGO. And then uh, they hope to ramp that up to where it's roughly three a day. So some unusual events are showing up. You know, are they really unusual events or, or are we not interpreting right? So we have a new phase. That's one of consolidation, statistics, digging into the systematics and understanding phenomena better. Then we'll be able to deal with the new science and discovery as soon as we do that. So this is a partial learning example of how you do science in both ways when you look for something that you know you want to look for. And then when you look for stuff, you, you're trying to find out what nature's telling you. So thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Smoot, for the very interesting talk. Now, if there are no objections, we can open the Q&A session. And let me remind the audience that if you have any questions, you can ask your questions through this Q&A button. So we have a very interesting question from Ruslan. Ruslan asks, in the multi-level black hole merger model, how much time does it take for the third generation heavy, heavy black hole to form? Right. So that's a good question. And I don't know the answer to that because most of the people who model it happening in stellar clusters or in the near the galactic center, they find, maybe not in the galactic center, but in stellar clusters, they find that when the heavy ones uh, come together, they get kicked out of the stellar cluster and then they evolve and merge. And then they're in a not strong environment unless somehow they get back in the stellar cluster. They can't find another black hole to, to do. You're wandering around the galaxy looking for a big black hole is not so profitable, right? It's, it's like looking for other things. So I don't know how long it takes. When you, when you form a black hole pair in a stellar cluster, you have a lot of what you would call kind of three body interactions. There's the two black holes will be tightly bound, but they will occasionally be bumped by other stars coming nearby and perturbing them. And that helps circularize their orbits and let them give off some energy and momentum and get closer together so that they can evolve pretty quickly. And so Tom uh, was looking at this and he was saying, you can actually have uh, a, a, a set of the black holes you know, have a relatively short lifetime that is in the scales of, of certainly more than millions of years, but less than half a billion years before they merge, right? And, and then be ready to merge again with someone else. Okay, thank you very much. Ruslan has another question. He asks, in your opinion, what is the most probable scenario for the formation of supermassive black holes? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I've thought about this problem on and off for many years. And it's actually tricky because if you look carefully at the data, there seems to be an indication that even in some fairly young galaxies, very early in the universe, there are already central supermassive black holes. And that means they didn't just appear recently, you know, 10 billion years into the in the, or 10 billion or 15 billion years in the age of the universe, that they appear uh, back when the universe was less than a billion years old, and sometimes in the hundreds of millions of years old. And so how do you make them? And how do you make them in such a way they tend to be correlated with the mass of the galaxy they're in? As if, if you plot the estimated mass of the black hole and the estimated mass of the galaxy that resides in, it's pretty much a straight line plot, uh, in log log or whatever, uh, or linear of about 10 to the minus, I forget it was, 10 to the minus six. It's a small, you know, I have to look it up, I've forgotten the number. It's a small fraction of the total mass of the galaxy, but it's a non significant mass that ends up in the black hole. And the problem is if you wanna make the black holes by making a hundred solar mass black hole and then creating material onto it, it takes a really long time to make it. And how does that know very well how 
mass of the galaxy it is in is. So there must be something more complex that either the black holes, the supermassive black holes are formed very early and they help regulate the formation of the galaxy itself or some kind of complicated thing going on. I looked at the various things. It's very difficult to make them. And so it's an unsolved problem. It's a good research area for somebody who wants to try and do that. Okay, thank you very much for the nice answer. We have another interesting question from Leo. Leo asks about the highest uh, mass gravitational wave event so far. Since it was also at the highest redshift, could there be a correlation between the redshift and the high mass of the event? Yeah, so the answer is the one that I spent so much time that, that GW190521, that is the highest mass known one to date or published one to date. And it is at the highest redshift. Now, if you ask where should a black, where, where should a candidate be, right? It should be equally anywhere in its detectable volume, right? It should be random within its detectable volume. And uh, when I look for this, things aren't quite that way. But so that means there's other things going on in the way that 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 the like over really selects the data or the way they process it. However, if you look at what the volume looks like versus mass, you realize it's the volume is we would say normally the proportional distance and distance should be proportional to the sum of the masses. That's approximately there's a little bit of a factor down from that because of frequency. So essentially it should go up as the cube of the mass. It really goes up as the five halves power of the mass, how far you can see. And but where you should see it is anywhere equally in that volume, but there's a lot more volume out at big distance than there is at small distance. So it goes up as the as the cube of one plus z. So in terms of the, the, the volume does, and so the derivative is one plus z squared. So you expect it to be at a, the more massive object should on average be at a higher z than the low mass, the neutron star, neutron star, you can only detect relatively close by. Whereas these super heavy mass ones, you can only detect, you can detect out the great distances. So your, your odds of, you're gonna get a lot more volume to look at, and the odds are they're going to be out. It's like the surface of a sphere this big, right? Is d squared times the surface of the sphere that big. And so it's going to be out towards the outer part of the sphere, right? I should be able to calculate off the top of my head, but it's the odds are 50% of the time it will be 71% uh, of, the, of the radius it could be at or higher, right? Okay, thank you. There is a follow-up to Leo's question. If there is indeed a, if there is an indeed a preference for having heavy black holes at high redshift, this would imply a redshift evolution of mass function. Most naturally, it's a result of population three star formation at redshift higher than ten. Right. Do you so have a yes? I was trying to tell people to be careful. Don't take the LIGO data right at face value. You know the early results were interesting and exciting because they were the discovery of gravity waves and the discovery of binary black holes. But now you want to look at and see what they really tell you. You just don't take their answer. I try to be careful about how to say, don't just take their answer and say, this is right. Look and see if there are alternatives for what it might be. The fact is, it's, there is no evidence so far, although you need to look at the detected volume over the possible, the, the volume at which it's, the distances which are detected over the possible volume where it was detected. You will see there isn't such a strong, there is a sum, but there isn't such a strong bias towards higher, you know, greater distance and higher redshift. And, and so you can't jump, you've got to do that statistics yourself, but you also have to think because it comes from a higher redshift, that means its frequency was lower. And does that mean they've processed the data differently or they have a different sensitivity and you have to be careful that there's an instrumental bias in there that they haven't taken out. They just give you a list of the candidates. They haven't given you a list of efficiency corrected candidates. All right, so finish the question. <laughs> okay, so uh, just uh, last part of the question was, uh, do you have a personal remark on similar idea? So I don't know. 
for a long time, I was working on the idea that a lot of these events could be explained by gravitational lensing. This whole new set of data, some of the things are possible to be gravitational lensing, some of the things are not, but I didn't call out in that one shot. One of them that I showed you was color coded. It was color coded by the spins of the of the of the um, the the masses in the the binary masses, right? And so, if there are things that came from, you know, essentially supernova formed black holes, and then they randomly end each other, they should have basically near zero spin, but if they already form for merging, they should have a spin of about 0 0.7 to 0.8. And then you can look and see, and there, if, you were, if you looked at that plot, you will see there were three or four events that were up in high mass that did have a high spin, hmm. according to the best fit that LIGO Virgo gave us. Doesn't mean it's correct, right? But it means it's it's the, their first best fit. So it is quite possible that three or four of those events were merger events. And that would argue for the dynamical formation, but only one generation, right? That, they're, that they, came from, they came from a first generation and then they somehow captured a, another black hole on the way out and then they merged. It's, it's early to tell. We got to understand the data and the and the LIGO Virgo team got to expand their priors to make sure they're fitting to more possibilities. Right? Okay, thank you very much. And in the context of um, the tension between stellar evolution community predictions and uh, what we see in LIGO Virgo that you, uh, tr uh, that you were trying to address, um, how, um, how robust are the predictions of the stellar evolution community in your opinion? Is there room for something to be completely wrong? The, the answer is uh, there is room because most people in the early days of stellar evolution and supernovas, most people only do one dimensional code or two dimensional code, occasionally now they're doing three dimensional code, but people have difficulty getting supernova to explode. So knowing whether there can be fallback, it's quite possible that supernova, you know, somehow God made the universe very inefficiently. And a huge fraction of the heavy mass stars that go off, instead of spreading that material out to make second generation stars and planets, which we know somehow the universe does very effectively, some big fraction of those just fall back and make massive black holes. Right? That's possible. That's not what the, the evolution would see. But it's very hard to get around the pair instability. Right? If you have a a star that has 100 solar masses and it has a little bit of oscillation going on. You know, the sun has, has thousands of oscillations going on all the time. If you look, you can do, you know, there are telescopes that look at the sun and measure the variations in the surface of the sun and they can decompose the normal oscillations of the sun into thousands of different modes. It's a very high Q device. It's quite spectacular. And that same thing is true of many other stars. Some stars, like C feed variables are well known to be oscillating. That's on a long period where you can humans can observe it easily, but with instruments you can see there. So as soon as you start having oscillations in a star, if some of those oscillations travel towards the core, you're going to be in the regime where you can make electron and positron pairs, and that makes it more springy and soft, and that causes you to have these either total detonation or small detonations of uh, you know, carbon nitrogen oxygen up towards silicon. And that helps blow the outer shell of the star off. And it's very hard to avoid that, right? You need somehow to have it blow into a supernova and then not have it have enough drive to blow the outer mass off, but have it all fall back. And it's you know, like you, in the Hollywood movies, when you blow up something, all these pieces come raining down. Well all the pieces of zoom are got to come back raining down on the black hole and get absorbed. That's possible. It's called a fallback supernova, a fallback black hole. It's possible to do that, but then you got the problem with how come some supernova blow up and how come some don't, right? And uh, so the answer is, yes, there's room. It's hard to imagine 
that you don't blow away big star, blow away the stuff in the in the hundred solar masses up towards two hundred solar masses. Those those progenitor stars, they should blow a lot of their envelope off. Right. It's only when you get up to much heavier stars that you then can have supernova that end up making two hundred solar mass black holes. Right. But I don't know. You know, somebody might be able to think of something clever. But I don't. I don't think. I don't think you can get around some of these things easily without disrupting a bunch of other stuff, but we'll see what happens. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, do you think we could, uh, uh, the telescopes that we have at Energetic Cosmos Laboratory, this fast telescope, which is aimed at exploring uh, powerful explosions in the universe, gamma ray burst, using this telescope, we could shed some light into some of the open questions that you just highlighted. We have to cross our fingers. So one of the exciting things that happened was last year, a less than a year ago, uh, a fast radio burst signal was seen from inside our own galaxy. And we used that telescope with existing cameras to try and look for it. I've been trying to encourage Albert, who's on here, to make some observations with the silicon photomultipliers to get that camera going. Um, and, you know, what if there is a, you know, a binary black hole inside of our galaxy that, that, that decides to merge? Can we, you know, then we get a tremendous signal noise. We can do a lot of physics, a lot of things, we, but we have to see. We could also hope that there might be some black hole orbiting near the supermassive black hole in the center of, the, of our galaxy, in which case we'll see the gravity waves from that and it will You'll see all kinds of perturbations. It again will provide a lot of information, and we could have a chance to see what's going on there too with the cameras, because we don't know we don't know what's going to happen. And so the answer is, it's good to have an automated telescope. It's good to have really good cameras on it that you can then bring to bear on this kind of stuff. But you know, it's it's a question of how many how many black holes go off in our galaxy. Not so many. How many go off in the universe? Well, there's a whole bunch. There's one went off during my lecture. You know, it's, they just, you know, they're happening all the time. It's a question of whether they're close enough for you to observe. Our telescope probably can only observe stuff that's in the nearby group, but we'll see. Okay, oh, thank you very much. Our last question is from Tair Baltabai. Um, Tair is asking, in your opinion, uh, he has a long question, but I'm I will try to rephrase it in a short form. In your opinion, what is the ultimate unified theory of physics? <laughs> What's the ultimate, you know? So we don't know. So we all hope that eventually physics gets completely unified and there gets to be no degrees of freedom left, right? One of the things that when I was young that's most attractive about string theory was the predominance to get rid of what we at the time had 17 parameters to describe all physics down to one just one single parameter, which was the string tension, and that was going to define all the physics. And then they discovered the landscape, the landscape, and they got to be 10 to the 500th. And then you have to think of some way to reduce that down to some other stuff. So we don't know what would happen. We would hope that physics would be unified and we would see that there's only one possible way that things could fit together. But I think we're a ways from that, but we have the opportunity to see the trend continue. We've seen physics become more and more unified, and now unified with other sciences. I mean, chemistry and physics aren't so clearly different when you go down and talk about the various things. Molecular biology and physics are not so different, and chemistry are not so different. So you expect the knowledge to eventually unify more. It's a question of, will it be as pretty and as tight as we wish for aesthetically? So. Also, how long is it going to take? I don't, I don't have a problem recommending to young people to take a career in physics. I think <laughs> physics is going to be around for quite some time longer. There's a lot of interesting problems left to deal with. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for ask, answering all of our questions. Now I will pass the floor to Kanat Abdulalish Baigarian for concluding remarks. Professor, thank you very much for two days of being with you, two, two, two evenings to be with you. So unfortunately, uh, we have uh, online lectures here in Azerbaijan University. 
but the distance is essentially lower, uh, uh, less than the distance between the objects in the universe. <laughs> and time is also more <laughs> shorter than you know, the billion of years. So I see uh, we have here uh, Ade. Yes, yes, I'm here. Maybe yeah. Ade can add, yeah. add something for the... Sure. sure. Thank you very much, George. Uh, thank you for two evenings of uh, terrific physics. I think I'm an applied physicist. I don't understand black holes too much, but it looks as if I, many of in our audience understand the black holes and neutron stars. But... Uh, we're very happy that you were able to give us uh, two, two evenings of your time and uh, elucidate some of the, the, the physics of the universe, essentially. Right. You so, realize so, originally I was coming, going to come to the to, 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 I was going to say, yes. Nusatan, Nusatan. And, and give these lectures in person. But yes. But the COVID-19 COVID yeah. have other yeah. ideas. Hopefully by next year, there'll be vaccines and then you can come on ground and uh, really have a big uh, lecture in, uh, not only at, at uh, Nazarbayev University, but across Kazakhstan. So right. we're looking forward to next year and uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure many of our students will be happy to listen to you in person next year when you come. Well, hopefully I, I, I picked this topic and because I was really interested in the second part of the stuff that I just gave today yeah. because I'm working on it myself. But the fact is, I was expecting to talk to, to just the physics and astronomy students, so I probably still made it too technical. But I'm still struggling to understand a lot of the things I'm seeing in the data. Well, we'll hopefully get you on campus so you can excite our students to go into physics. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> to go into the areas of physics, definitely. Thank you very much for, for giving us your lecture, and uh, we hope to see you on campus next year. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you, George. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a, have a good evening. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, audience. I don't know. Somewhere in the ether. <laughs> thank <laughs> you. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to do this again next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Across Kazakhstan. Thank you, Adam, for your Ra being Rafmet. here. Oh, Rafmet. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.